Uh, Miles, <laughs> good Thank morning. Thank you. Good morning, Judy. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks uh, for being here. Yeah, we appreciate it. And Ian, Jacqueline, and Tony, thank you guys for joining in person and for all those uh, online as well. I look forward to telling you guys a bit about my background today and getting into, um, yeah, some of our topics at hand. So. Yeah, and uh, just for anyone who's online, feel free to put your questions in the chat box feature, and we'll make sure to incorporate those questions as we as we go along. And anyone from the audience, if you have a question, just jump right in, and uh, the more conversational, the better. Um, but uh, let's jump in. So. Miles, tell yes. us a little bit about your background and what led you to uh, getting to the point of just starting your own business Perfect. down that path. Perfect. Thank you. And I'm actually going to use one slide here I think will be helpful to uh, to help um, tell you guys a little bit more about my background here. Um, so let me see if I could get this. Oh, good question. On the side there go on there we go okay yay <laughs> okay so um so by the way this is my company um high view solutions our mission statement is building your business for tomorrow and i'll tell you a little bit more about how we operate as a company and, and what we do but as i introduce myself i, I want to first give you guys just a footing on like where i'm coming from and and, and what i've built and then i'm going to go into my background um i'll probably come back to this and talk about that mission but just so you guys know a little about me and what, what i've built um, this is my co-founder, Narja Patel, and I, and Highview Solutions today is a Google Cloud partner. We have about 450 customers, and we do about $12 million of, of annual revenue, and I call that annual recurring revenue because a lot of that's tied to multi-year contracts, and, and we have about 18 staff today. We have a few W-2 staff members in the U.S., a few 1099 contractors, and then we actually have a large presence down in El Salvador in Central America, um, but again, I'm going to come back to some of this. I just wanted to uh, ensure you guys are, yeah, get a sense of um, what I've what I've built so far as I talk about my background. But let me go back and talk mm -hmm. about like before Highview and, and where I came from. Um, so I actually worked at Square up in San Francisco for for five years. Um, Square is like a merchant services, and 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 you guys probably know them by making the small credit card readers for farmers market vendors to accept credit card payments. Um, in college, my friend and I actually started a small little business selling like Chinese teas. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and we are we went to UC Berkeley, we were selling tea, and we actually used Square to accept credit card payments. And we had graduated and very quickly realized that we just could, we didn't know how to make money and we needed to get a job. And we loved this product that we had used to sell our tea. So we actually emailed Keith Raboy, who at the time was the chief operating officer at Square. I found his personal email on a blog and he replied and he oh, said, hey, like, I love that you guys have used our product. You're 22 years old. Why don't you come in and like tell us about what we're doing wrong and what we could be doing better from like the merchant perspective. So my friend and I, Nick, we uh, went over to San Francisco, walked into Square and they actually offered us a job. And That's so insane. yeah, so we ended up, <laughs> yeah, so we ended up like getting hired there. And that was in uh, 2011. So Square had about 200 employees at the time. So it was sort of in this big phase of um, this like rapid growth growth mode. Uh, we were actually the first young like sales hires. So before uh, my buddy Nick and I, Square had no phone support. And so um, there wasn't actually a lot of people at the company talking to merchants. So there's mm -hmm. these product teams, people were building stuff but they were busy in like whiteboarding and prioritizing features. And so they would call up Nick and I and say, hey, we need you guys to go find out about like, um, like split tender, like when companies, people wanna pay cash and credit card as part of a transaction, what do merchants think about that? And they would deploy us and we'd go talk to these business owners. So um, fast forwarding just to some of my observations over like a five year span at Square before I started my business, I had the opportunity to meet what I call like, and I've always wanted to put this on a slide, my, my badass merchants and business owners. So um, every day there was at that time, there was thousands of companies signing up for Square. And as all of us think about small business, we think about a farmer's market vendor, a coffee shop, a food truck. There's certain like archetypical small businesses. But what we actually found looking through the list of signups is that there was like thousands of other businesses that don't really have much of a powerful brand, but the actual payment volumes that they were doing were like way more 
than like a taco truck or a coffee shop. So it sort of broadened my eyes being a young grad, realizing there's all those businesses out there that just make tons of money that like no what, one's ever heard of. What type of business like surprised you and you're like, oh, wow, like they're actually making money. And yeah, it's a good question. So we were hired on board in like the fall. And I remember uh, ramping up, there was tons of these Christmas tree farms. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's a really interesting business because um, a lot of the owners of those Christmas tree farms, um, they only work. They have like this three month sprint out of the year. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the background to support those three months. But it's insane. Like the amount of like money and a lot of the profit that actually will make in that short amount of time. And a lot of them have like, I remember there's this guy in Pennsylvania that had like 12 different Christmas tree farm locations. Wow. And um, another one was like specialty, like cleaning services, like deep commercial kitchen cleaning, uh, mold remediation services. Like those guys were just printing money because there was a uh, uh, clients of theirs. Like if you had a mold issue, you were often willing to spend a ton of money to get that fixed right away. Or yeah. if your commercial kitchen was shut down due to the health department, you will pay any amount of money to get that up really? and running. So yeah. that was another one. Um, emergency locksmith businesses. Oh, those yeah. guys just like in San Francisco, they would charge like usurous rates in the middle of the night. Um, and those guys made a ton of money. And then in random one other, and then I'll move on from this point was a specialty rug sales. So like there's these guys that were importing rugs and they were around the Bay area and, but they would charge like thousands and thousands of dollars and kind of sell these rugs like out of the back of their car, but, but they'd be like high-end, um, like Berber rugs from North yeah. Africa and yeah. authentic. They, right. but it's just like a type of entrepreneur that you don't think about when you think about a small business. So, um, that was kind of broad in my perspective too. Wow. There's a lot out there. Th this second point was I looked at kind of over time the lifestyles of, at the time I was 22, and I looked at 35 to 40 year olds that were working at Square, and Square was like a classic startup, like they served dinner every night at mm. 7 p.m., mm. and so everyone would get in in the morning, and you'd be there like through this 12-hour day, sometimes people would leave for the gym, but it was like corporate grinding like life, like lots of coffee, mm -hmm. lots of hours in the office, and I kind of looked at the age group of 35, 40, like people that started having kids, and the lives that those entrepreneurs, or that, sorry, the, the Square employees were living is tough. You know, a yeah. lot of them were, yeah. um, them and their wife or, or husband, like both worked. Um, they had kids in daycare and they were trying to juggle this like very demanding work schedule, um, requiring tons of hours in front of a computer with having a family. And then kind of looking at that versus some of our customers like that I was looking at, like these specialty rug sales guys, like they they were doing really well and, and they were making good money, but they had more control over their schedule. And so it was the first time in my life where I realized like there are different paths to making mm -hmm. money than just like a standard corporate path, which I was on. like, I had gone to UC Berkeley, tried really hard in school, graduated. I was super excited to work at the mm -hmm. startup, um, but there were different paths. So that kind of illuminated my um my mind to there being like other options and some of these lifestyle businesses which I'll talk about in a sec is the foundation of, of Highview this last point here I just like to highlight that being in San Francisco in like the 2010s Sahil it's actually a, a kid I know he's the second employee at Pinterest and then left at the 11th month before he vested his equity oh. and and started Gumroad which ended up becoming like a venture-backed company selling online products but this idea, I remember he posted this tweet, like just had an idea for my first billion dollar company, like tomorrow I start building it. It kind of encapsulates for me this like huge focus through the 2010s in the Bay Area around tech-based like startup culture and startup entrepreneurship. And I think it did over time arise to this sort of like group think mentality for a lot of grads coming out of school where they felt like if they wanted to be really successful, there was like a path for them to like go down the startup route. Um, if you look at actually where MBA graduates go in 2011, MBA grads were all going into finance and consulting still. But by 2021, according to like this um, uh, McKinsey report, 30% of MBA grads were going into tech into the technology field. Mm -hmm. So it's just an interesting trend to see that like over a over a decade and. I think one of the downsides of this is a lot of the other entrepreneurial paths um, that can be taken 
uh, are, are largely like ignored as as everyone was like so obsessed with this 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 uh, this startup craze. I, I want to show this slide, then I'll pause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this is actually a photo from Dropbox, and this kind of encapsulates like the startup culture. And it was so infectious because you have food, everyone's in there, everyone's working on interesting problems. I remember going out to dinner with friends in the 2010s and everyone that worked in tech was like envied and everyone who didn't work in tech was trying to figure out how to get into tech. But arguably like a lot of those careers of people outside of tech, they were doing just as well as all right. of us. Right. It just didn't have that aura of like excitement around it. Um, so anyways, that, that's just kind of some uh, some background I wanted to share um, before kind of going into um, my business and, and why, why I created it. Um, yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm super impressed that at, at, uh, in your 20s, you already had that, um, uh, you were able to have that perception, like of, of, of taking a step back and understanding those differences, you know, because so, it is so easy to get caught up in the, on the hamster wheel in when you're in Silicon Valley, working in tech, uh, that that carrot of the you know the stock options and the vesting and the potential to cash out and so on and so forth. It's uh, super impressive. Yeah, uh, thank you. It, yeah. you know, I did have an unfair advantage though. My my dad is a business owner, okay. and so I grew up in Fresno. And being in a smaller city like Fresno, there's not a lot of corporate right. corporate jobs there. It's it's really a town of small businesses. Yeah. My dad was a small business owner, ran a retail store, and so I think I had that in my mind a bit as well. And yeah. so. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is an important thing for young people to to, to pay attention yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that. Um, and as as we were talking before we started, uh, it's so important to highlight that the the angel funding, equity funding, VC funding route isn't the only route. Like, there's these very legitimate, uh, successful businesses that um, don't need that type of funding that, uh, obviously, you know, with 12, 12 million in AR, that's pretty, super impressive. Uh, there's a way to get there. Um, and I need to go through the investor route. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, so you were there for five years, uh, and then is that what, what happened, uh, after those five years? Like what, what was the trigger, uh, were you already having ideas to launch Highview? Uh, how did you meet your co-founder? Like, how did things start falling into place uh, for the launch of this business? Yeah, it's a good question. Leaving this world was really hard, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of, I, I used to call it, because I experienced that in the early 2000s okay. during the internet bubble, yeah. but it's it's kind of the, the silver handcuffs, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. We call them the golden golden handcuffs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of silver because you are right, making right. 16 hour days, so you're only really making 10 bucks an hour, you know? Um, <laughs> uh but yeah it's hard to leave that yeah yeah I, you know i i was fortunate in that i had gotten involved with square early on and i had just like a great five years there and so i actually took time off and took four months to travel first mm -hmm. and so I, I had gone like on indonesia and done some traveling which i had always wanted to do in my life but i didn't have that chance to do it after college because i sort of had this job come up at square and jumped into it um so I'd always wanted that just personally in, in, in life. And I'd saved up from some money from Square. Um, and yeah, it was against the better judgment of like my parents. Yeah. A lot of people that I yeah. knew were like, what are you doing? You're leaving this like incredible, fast growing company that's doing really well. Like why, why leave? But for me, I always knew that I, I wanted to try um, to build something on my own. And I was fascinated by like this opportunity of, of um, uh, what I saw some of these square merchants and customers actually building, like mm -hmm. kind of like an alternative, what, what I'm going to call like a lifestyle business, which I'll present as like a definition here. Was it kind of like your five-year case study? Like, because you, did you always know you wanted to start your own business, but this was just a way to gain knowledge, experience, it, insight? You know, I didn't know. I think I always had a, a, a dream. I think a lot of people have like a dream of doing something on their own. and But I didn't know. I didn't know for sure that I, I would do it. Um, so yeah, yeah, but I think Square kind of gave me that confidence, um, and just realizing that there's a path out there. The other thing I'll mention too, by looking at some of these customers is I realized that compared to the career paths in startups and corporate, which is like hyper competitive, like there's only one director position mm. and there's a lot of different people vying for that path, that career path. Um, 
I was looking at these square merchants and I'm like, God, this emergency locksmith guy, I think makes more money than like, right, all, right. like all of us or like the specialty cleaning business owner. Like, but they, but how they run their business was like pretty like casual and they were experts yeah. at what they did, but it, it it didn't feel like it had the same like hyper competitive nature because like, those guys were kind of embracing and women were like yeah. embracing like the lifestyle aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just like a path less, less, less taken. Sometimes, yeah, so. yeah. So, uh, so you went traveling, you came back, uh, did you, how did you meet your co-founder and how, well, how did the idea come about? Uh, is it from meeting your co-founder and you guys brainstormed and had this idea or yeah. was it the other way around? How, how did that come about? Yeah, I'll, I'll go through that. And let me actually now, cause I was going to talk about here, like on how we like defined our business, but, okay. um, before I go here, let me just go all the way back to like, just like our, our mission statement and, and, you know starting of, of the business so uh, i knew i wanted to create like a, a lifestyle focused business um and i knew i wanted to use my skill set that i have which is really around like sales and tech sales um and so i found that a lot of these tech companies had like small like service partner programs where like they didn't want to do the um in our case like google doesn't want to do data migration for small businesses mm -hmm. and so i found the google cloud partner program and I actually originally like created like my LLC with the goal of, um, yeah, building out a practice. And how I did this was I started looking around um, at other Google Cloud partner businesses and I spoke with some of them. And same thing I kind of observed with looking at some of these square merchants. I was like, you know what? I can do this. Like these guys aren't to a level of sophistication where I feel like I can't get to. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like, okay, if I worked at it, like they're just putting together quotes and doing migration services and they have one or two engineers that work for them. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem like out of reach or sometimes being in um, San Francisco, like you saw entrepreneurs, like my old boss at Square, Max Rhodes went on to build like this billion dollar company called Fair. But like those types of entrepreneurs, it always seemed like out of, out of reach for me because I saw the level that they were performing at mm -hmm. um, and this seemed tangible. So I remember looking at like this Google partner program talking to some of the people in the industry, realizing I can do this. And then how I met Narjit, uh, and she, my business partner lives in Florida, by the way. And, uh, um, and she was actually leading the Google Cloud practice at a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And I got hired as a contractor because I was trying to start a business in an industry I didn't know <laughs> much about. And so they hired me as a contractor um, doing like Google Workspace training. Oh, wow. yeah. so you were yeah. a trainer. Like, yeah, I was yeah. doing, I was like training like these executives on like how to get out of Outlook. Oh, and so yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, it's okay. You're going to Gmail and they you know you're in Outlook, you know, but in my mind, it was all part of this like plan to eventually start my own practice. But yeah, I found myself at 27, like leaving this hot startup. And then I'm like doing Gmail trainings <laughs> for like 50 bucks an hour, you know? Um, but I met Narjit and then she actually had just had her first kid and um, didn't want to continue her career path in the corporate world with, mm. with a kid. So I had sort of pitched the idea to her like, hey, I want to build like my own Google Cloud partner business around this like idea of a lifestyle business. Yeah. Do you want to join me? And um, being a mom, I understand that lifestyle is important to you. Like, let's like use that as a foundational principle yeah. and build that from, from, from the ground. So I'll come back to our mission statement, but I'll go to this slide because this kind of defined on how we thought about what Highview was, was going to be. Um, and I'm kind of extracting, ex, um, abstracting away from actually what we do. So I'll, I'll tell yeah, you guys yeah, a bit more about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but we basically like set out this lifestyle business definition. So when people think lifestyle business, I think you just mentioned this. I think sometimes people think of like, oh, I'm just like contracting and I make a bit of money mm -hmm. and I have a lifestyle. But in my mind, a lifestyle business could be like anything under the sun. Like yeah. you can grow a really large business. I think of some of these like electrical company business owners I know that make like $20 million a year, but they own everything mm -hmm. and they have, you know, planes and stuff, but it's still a lifestyle business. Yeah, they don't yeah. have a lot of outside capital, if any. Um, so basically we started with a tool where we just wanted to run Highview as a tool for personal enrichment and fulfillment, meaning like the business was going to exist as a means to allow us to live our lives. And so 
couple sub points is we decided to like set goals and I'll actually take you guys through how we do this in 2023 being like six years into the business. So yeah, I'm blown away here. Like it's, it, it was, it's all about you, the business owners of your business and your team and your goals as a team, your personal goals as a team. And how do you help everyone reach their goals through the business? It's, yes. it's, it's like it, the epitome of the lifestyle business. This is amazing. It, it totally, that's how we started. And and I will say it as owners, yeah. initially it, it was what's best for Narjit and I as owners. Yeah. And then as we hired, people understood that they're working at a company where we're prioritizing lifestyle first. And so it attracts certain types of people that, for instance, we have a couple engineers that love to travel. Yeah. And we told them like, hey, it's not a problem. Like we're a remote company. Like one of them's in South Korea right now, going to Europe next week. And I said, look, I don't care if, if you travel all over the world, as long as you're getting all your stuff done and online. Yeah. Yeah. But for him, that was great because yeah. he wasn't at, being asked every two weeks to be in a certain physical location, right. which for him allowed him to live his lifestyle. Totally. So, but yeah. But I mean, you know, so most uh, businesses set their uh, vision mission is focused on their customers, right? Yeah. It's completely inward facing, which it, is it was. amazing. It, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's different. Awesome. Yeah. It's it's very self interested, but we figured, you know, if we're going to build something, like, let's make it work well for mm -hmm. us. And then we can figure out everything else from there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So we started that uh, and I'll show you guys how this actually looks. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is like prioritizing income over equity growth. So I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs start down a path and they're focusing on how to grow their business, service their customers. We always wanted to prioritize income, meaning like the first year we we, we grew really slow because we didn't have a lot of money to invest. Yeah. But at the end of the year, we made like some profit. I think we made like $10,000 and so not that much money. And if you account for like time, you could say yeah. that we arguably like lost right, right. a lot of money that first year. But my, my point is that hitting that $10,000 was still a milestone for us because we're still profitable. And so we've always prioritized being profitable and being income generating over equity growth. And what that also means over time is a lot of companies dump a lot of their income back mm -hmm. into growth, especially those early years. Um, but we actually have always taken money off the table and um, use that personally to make other investments. Um, and that means that our company does grow. It has grown more slowly. So I'm happy that well, we've been. It has to grow if you're wanting to have more income, right? Yeah, so it's it, kind exactly. Of like, yeah, yeah. 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 You you put everything upside down its head and it works. It's crazy. Um, yeah, it's it, it's yeah. a yeah, it's a different way to think about it. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I I personally, when I talk to young entrepreneurs growing their business, I feel like they're focused on growth a lot. But m maybe they miss like like the unit economics. Like, hey, you're you're doing really good at generating revenue, but how much money are you actually making? And I feel like a lot of young entrepreneurs forget that at the end of the day, the goal is to make money, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it's okay to like embrace that and then and then focus on that so yeah yeah oh. no, that's great yeah. um so let's see uh when did you actually launch the company what year was it uh 2016, 2016. And later 2016 okay. and then how long and then at some point you started really seeing the ramp up so how yeah. long did it take you to get there and what what happened for the ramp up to take that you have know, to take place yeah so um, I call it like the wilderness years, like kind of 26, late 2016, 2017 was kind of that first full year, 2018, um, we're kind of just Narja and I as owners. And then we had a bunch of contractors, but we actually didn't hire uh, really any like full-time staff until like later 2018. Okay. Uh, and part of that is we wanted to take income off the table and payroll is is scary when it's all on you and you don't have any other investor um especially when you start realizing oh wow like you hire someone they have a family they have to take care of so we spent a lot of time getting really good and um we networked extensively in the google partner ecosystem we started getting some big subcontracts from larger partners um, we started building like big inroads with google as being like this specialty team a lot of the other Google partners have hundreds of employees and all of a sudden they'd be like, oh, let's just send this to Miles and Margin. Mm -hmm. like they can take care of this. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of like our, our wilderness years where we started really accelerating 
I think was uh, probably the first part, late part of 2018, early 2019. And the inflection point is we started hiring down in El Salvador. Um, yeah. Why El Salvador? Yeah. So we found, and actually, I'll, I'm actually going to skip over here because I think this is actually a good time to talk about uh, international hiring and actually have a, I'm going to come back to this goals and reflecting, but um, I'm going to talk about this for a while. Yeah. So international hiring in general. So in late 2018, early 2019, we saw an opportunity in that like a lot of the other Google partners could not service like small customers actually. Right. Um, because the economics didn't work. And what I mean by small customers, um, for us, a small customer would be like a company under 100 employees and like a contract would be like a $10,000 migration project. And that customer might generate like three or four grand of, of revenue a year. And so it's not significant and, and from a, a company that has like large payroll costs. Mm -hmm. And so what we were finding is that every day we were talking to these Google teams and they would say, hey, we have like a huge list of customers that need migration services. They want to go to Google. They're on legacy exchange and legacy like Microsoft systems. Um, but none of the other partners would touch them for under $20,000. There's sort of this thing in the industry where everyone is like selling this bare minimum package. So two things would happen. You'd have like this electric, like an electrician company, like an owner that has 25 employees he'd either pay 20 grand and get his staff over to Google um, or he just wouldn't do it or do it himself and all their old data would get messed up and it was just like a nightmare. Um, so we found an opportunity to service the segment, but it wouldn't work using like US-based engineers. Like mm -hmm. the economics just don't work. So we actually started looking abroad and, and we found that down in El Salvador, there's actually a large Google support call center. And so we actually, I went down there and I did some like recruiting and networking down there and hired someone away from the call center oh, <laughs> to work for me as an engineer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so I don't speak much Spanish, by the way. <laughs> and um, it actually, I think, worked to my advantage, though, because I ended up finding staff down in El Salvador. They're like, hey, I speak English eight hours a day, every day. Like, let's just do everything in English. And I'm yeah. like, great. Yeah. Thank you. But it actually worked out great because over time, those engineers ended up being customer facing. And nowadays, fast forward, no one, none of our clients even realize that our team's down in El Salvador. Is, <laughs> they just amazing. like think that maybe, you know, like Mexican Americans is what yeah. most of our clients think, you know, yeah. like grew up speaking Spanish at home. And so there's a bit of an accent. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyways, um, I wanted to kind of go through a, a bit more like on my thoughts on international hiring for, for you guys or for anyone that's listening as a small business. So one of the things we found over the years with hiring internationally, and I view this as like a huge opportunity for small businesses. One is um, focus on talent, not just savings. My original goal was like, how could I find like more affordable labor? But actually you get like super quality talent. And, mm. and so um, even if you pay a little bit more than you were planning to by going abroad, um, you can oftentimes get a um, professional that's like a lot better than, than you would mm. uh, here, here, here locally. Um, so that's one point. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other points. The other thing that's interesting with hiring internationally, we didn't realize this till, so we started hiring in late 2018, early 2019. And then um, by the end of 2020, we had like 10 people down in El Salvador. So we, wow. we hired a bunch of people over like a 24 month span. But like standard deduction rules apply, meaning like if you pay someone $3,000 a month, you just like deduct that and your accountant's like, that's just an expense. It's really straightforward. There's also no like payroll taxes, tax withholdings and HR stuff with hiring internationally, mm -hmm. which is really international. And as a, as, unless you get big enough where you start actually having a local presence there. But I use that just to highlight, like we, we treat our staff very well. We give like maternity, fraternity, we do, do a lot. They are employees. They're not, or are they independent contractors? Um, correct. So they're they're employees, but right. since but since they're not employees here in the U.S., yeah, yeah. there's no U.S. payroll taxes. There's no U.S. tax withholdings, and there's HR. So all of those things take a lot of money from a small business owner yeah. to navigate and figure out, and they're very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which you know some of you might might know. Um, uh, so anyways, that's great. And then this last point, you do have to pay attention to local nexus laws. So once you start triggering 
like a physical presence in another country. You have to be compliant with all of that country's rules and regulations. But from like the US tax law perspective, you could hire foreign contractors and just like wire transfer them money and then write that off as an expense and have them work for you remotely. So anyways, that's, awesome. that, that's yeah. kind of like an yeah. interesting opportunity yeah. that I wanted to highlight. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's your team. So you started growing your team uh, and that was 2020 and, yeah, like, and that's when you started seeing ramp up totally so. and so the ramp up came from that focus on the really small businesses that were just weren't getting service yeah that, that that's right that's right i was kind of reflecting on a few things that we uh uh we, we did right um over the years and in my mind this thing at the top like with an internet business and remote work even the most specialized businesses can find their target audience with relative ease so we're a highly specialized business so just to clarify what we do we provide migration services for companies that are moving to google workspace so you could be using apple mail or random mail clients and you decide that your small business now wants to consolidate to google workspace we help you get there mm -hmm. um but it's hyper niche and so as we started growing we thought, do we want to become more of like an IT provider providing other services? And we just decided to stay and just do like one thing. Hyper focused. Yeah, yeah, just really well. And then we realized that there's a huge market. Like there's millions, like every company in the world uses Microsoft or Google today for their collaboration platform. And so the addressable market of companies going to Google is like enormous. Mm -hmm. And so we realized we could just offer like a point solution and then just market that and deliver that remotely like anywhere mm -hmm. and um and then yeah that decision i think was huge so the typical path for a, a business is you get customers and then you can cross sell them other services you expand lines of business and you get more revenue from those customers we just decided over time to stay um hyper hyper niche just focus on our core migration services and then drive all of our staff to develop like extremely deep subject matter expertise mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is we expect all of our engineers to spend like at least 10 hours a month on like um, uh, additional certifications mm -hmm. or writing white papers. Wow, like, like, hours a month from yeah, everyone. Totally. From, 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 from our technical team. Yeah. Tech from, team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have like basically five guys yeah, that do a lot of like our engineering yeah. projects and we expect them to to do and invest heavily in, in that work. But that actually comes back because we post that stuff online or we send that to Google yeah. and then Google engineers realize, oh, wow, these guys are like quite in, into this migration world and yeah. they're discovering things about the product that they might not even know. And, and so they'll loop us in with customers uh, frequently because they know that we've become like a credible partner. So it's kind of part of your PR campaign yeah. with, with your biggest client right there. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 That's 100%. Great. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Um, can you share? So the way you're talking about this, you're talking, it seems like, oh, it was such a smooth, perfect ride, right? Like you start this business, you figure right. out the service, you found all these amazing employees. What were the hurdles? Yeah, so I'm guessing totally. there's some hurdles along the way, uh, things that you weren't expecting. Like, can you talk a little bit about that and how how you handled that and how you, you know? Yeah, you just, yeah. yeah, you're you're totally right. Like looking back, and um, it's actually good good feedback because I think I am painting a very rosy, like turnkey yeah, like, picture of how things have gone. Amazing, like, um, no launch. Ever. Yeah, I'm just highlighting all the good stuff. Yeah. By the way, guys, like <laughs> it's like gambling. You hear about the wins, not the losses. Not the losses. Yeah, <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so to your point, like some of the challenges, like I remember like starting my business and then like six months later, you know, like f finding Narjit and then like trying to get clients and then kind of running out of money. And then like, I had a bit of like square stock when I worked there and like selling that to like pay for like normal expenses. And then I was in my garage. I was like working from this garage and, um, I was like cold calling, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get customers because I hadn't really yeah. developed enough relationships with Google to get referrals and I didn't want to spend a bunch of money <laughs> investing um, in like a proper website and digital marketing plan. <laughs> so I was trying to brute force my way to like our first like 50 customers was my yeah. goal. Yeah. But yeah, those were tough, so that tough months. Perspective, like how many hours on the phone for how many months? Like just because sometimes I think, especially with our younger entrepreneurs, uh, that are, 
um, so we have quite a, you know, a, a spectrum of, of age groups. And yeah. the reason I say that is the more seasoned, you know, the 30, like 30, 40 year olds, they, they know, okay, this is kind of the grind you have to go through. And the younger ones typically, uh, you know, it's like, oh, like we're going to launch, it's going to be live and, you know, magic's going to happen overnight. And, okay. you know, the clients will be there. Like there's not that, always that real sense of, yeah, no, you're going to have to hit you know, uh, hit the pavement and, yeah. and go find those clients. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and time is like your enemy. I didn't realize that yeah. when I started my business, but yeah. like those, those long days of cold calling turn into like long months. And then like, you don't really have much money to like hang with your friends. And so then it's just, like you get in this cycle. Um, but I, one thing, one of the things I did with cold calling. So a lot of 2017 for me was just in my garage, like cold calling, trying to get like our first like batch of customers. Yeah. Um, I would call Google sales reps and say, Hey, do you have like a lost list of deals that you've lost over the last couple of years? And I will call them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it didn't actually work, but what it did is these Google reps that had all this pipeline of deals, they were like, Oh my God, miles just called like a hundred of my closed lost customers and brought me like one deal back. Like I'm going to like help him out and start giving uh, him some, some deals. So my takeaway from that is like, when you're willing to like put in the work and especially if you are looking to get like referrals, mm -hmm. any business that you start, I hope that you're doing something. There's like another company that exists in that space. And if there is become friends with them mm -hmm. and like, let them know that like you're willing to put in the time and mm -hmm. you could probably handle their companies that are too small their clients that are too small for them um but yeah it that was tough that was really tough another thing was um with with narjit like we're totally remote and I, I chose a business partner where we're on opposite sides of the country um choose the right fit as an as a partner and i'll talk a little bit more about our owner's plan and how we do that um but that was tough because a lot of days it was just me alone trying to figure out how to like get clients. Mm -hmm. Narjit's background is more on the services delivery side. So it was always understood that if I could figure out how to get customers, she, she, could, she could do the project, yeah. but I had to get the customer. Yeah. Um, yeah. But those were rough years, like 2017, part of 2018. Um, and then my, yeah, my advice is like, you should expect if you're going to start a business that it's kind of a five-year endeavor yeah, um, yeah. and um, you kind of do have to be prepared like like financially like I, I didn't probably have enough savings like yeah. when I started my business um, but then mentally you, everyone around you your partner like you kind of have to understand that like you're on like a very um, tough journey so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 no that's great that's really great yeah um, so for you the biggest hurdle was just starting that uh, the flywheel for to, to just get sales going yeah totally customers. that was the biggest yeah and i mentioned a lot of the startups yeah. here i'm sure everyone's always like sales and marketing that's yeah, everyone right. wants to ask questions about yeah, sales yeah, and marketing it's yeah. like the hardest thing yeah. as a it's business to start really true. Um, yeah. I, I i think i could go back here and um these slides are maybe a bit cut off but you know going back to this slide i talked about like our owner's goals i did kind of actually take our 2023 priorities as mm -hmm. nice owners and I could always go back through and, and uh, you know, w w walk you through how we actually outline our wants and needs. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Hey, so I thought that might yeah. be interesting for you guys to see, um, which, by the way, if it starting a business, I have been so happy having a business partner. But one of the things with having a partner, it's like having an investor. Like there's another person now involved mm -hmm. with maybe a different set of priorities. So, for instance, Narjit had a daughter and I was like a single 20 like 27 year old male that just had infinite amount of time, you know? And so, so like, those are like very much at odds, right? Like, I remember calling Narjit and she's like, Miles, it's like 9 PM at night. And I have a kid, like, I don't want to talk about our business right now, you know? And, and so fast forward over the years, I bring that up because I think there's naturally always um, like healthy dynamics when you pick a business partner um, that has like their own priorities and your group priorities. Yeah. And then, but you're willing to compromise and meet in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's basically what we do every year when we talk about like our wants and needs. So this is kind of like the culture that we established for each other in 2023. And we do this every year where we sit down and we talk about like what's important for us. And a lot of this is like, 
rectifying things that we maybe don't do right and um, trying to come to like a good consensus. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these and, and explain. So open calendars. So we're luckily now at a point where um, we try to free up our time. So that way, when our team needs something, we're not just slammed. Um, we going on time, by the way. Yeah, yeah, okay, totally. okay, yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, that's, I was just checking. Um, uh, oversight, yeah, like placing accountability. So Narjit, because she had a daughter and she's had two more kids since then. Um, she was so good at delegation. For me, my instinct was always just to do everything myself because I mm -hmm. had the time. And I was also, I, she's a bit older than me. So she had more managerial experience than I did. Um, and so it took a lot of years for me to develop into becoming like a better manager where I think she had that, mm -hmm. but it was good because it kind of like, I was able to do things initially and during those early years. And then as we started to grow, she was able to kind of develop me into a better, better manager. So that's those first two points. Um, micromanagement, that's just like a, a normal thing. Uh, let me talk about a couple of the things that this hours don't equal value. So this was a big mm -hmm. thing, like as partners, there's this weird dynamic that arises. And this is something that we've had a few tensions on over the years where I'm like, hey, I'm putting in more hours and, but we're 50, 50 business partners. Um, and I, it was mainly a reflection of the stage I was at in my life. Um, but I think the best way to handle this is instead of building up like resentment um, because I'm like, oh, I put in a full like 40 hour, 50 hour work week and you only worked 25, 30 hours, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, what we found is that really over time, hours don't equal value. Mm -hmm. and, and Narjit was doing less hours, but she was doing an exceptional job at getting all of her part of the business done. Mm -hmm. And you harbor a bit of resentment mm -hmm. naturally, but, but <laughs> you know, around that. But, but I think over time, using this as a principle, I've kind of been able to develop into this philosophy of like your hours don't equal like the value to your business. Mm -hmm. That's um, the point of your lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point, Ian. Yeah, it goes back to like that driving principle of, of the lifestyle business. Other things we try to do to encapsulate that, we try to do light meeting day on Fridays to allow for like catching up. So I'm sure you guys have all worked for people where it's like they're always slammed and it's really hard to get a hold of them. And and I never wanted to be that uh, leader. Um, and so we we intentionally try to leave Fridays to catch up on everything no question each other in front of other staff members. So this was something that actually came up um, in 2022 where Narja and I realized that we would have like open disagreement discussions in front of the team. And we were used to doing those conversations just one-on-one -on -one, because for the first couple of years, we would just sit there and disagree and talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. But we knew that we were partners and it was part of this process. Yeah. But when we started doing that in front of the team, and I think it was stressing out team members. Team yeah. members were going like, wait a minute, like, is everything not okay on the hump for like, what's going on? So we started ensuring that even if we had a disagreement that we talk about that separately and prevent a more a unified front to the team. Um, and then, yeah, taking time off that goes back to the lifestyle driven business and then be fact driven. So everyone always has like a strong opinions about stuff, but we, we try to like root everything back in facts so yeah. if i'm concerned about a part of the business where narjit is like around like our bandwidth of our delivery team we try to okay like let's first really look at what what the projects we have mm -hmm. in flight and you know instead of um so that's just like culturally something we try to do data driven yeah. yeah so we every year we do a culture for that year and a lot of it's carried over from prior years and we sort of add things onto it and then this other thing we do is we do like a wants and needs analysis. So, um, and this is something I think all entrepreneurs should do. I think probably every six months, if you're just starting out in the business, I wish we would have done it more early on, but like our needs is some examples is that like Narsh and I do a 30 minute call like every day now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have like a couple of yearly business, like um, uh, in-person events like we put in place a bunch of dashboards and reporting so that way we can get clear oversight of the mm. business, even if we're not technically involved. Yeah, dashboards are awesome. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and it's hard as a totally remote team. Um, yeah. It's easy to lose sight of what, what someone's doing. And then you think like, why, what, what did they do today? You know? Mm -hmm. And so um, having those dashboards is super important. Um, once a year, we call this like our owner sprint. So we do like, full on like 40 plus hour works for like a three month period. And we take on like a new initiative. 
Um, and that becomes like a big focus area. So we actually like last year decided that was launching in Mexico. So we actually mm -hmm. set up like a local entity down there, spent yeah. some time in Mexico. Um, and so that's kind of a thing we do. And then this last one is just like, we need to maintain a certain level of income to support our lifestyle. And this other wants is just like family time, personal development, learning from failures and celebrating success. So it's not very exciting, but I just wanted to share it with you guys because it's like really truly like what we what we do and what we so do. So do you know if you have the same one? It's it's one that you agree to together or do you each have your own? Uh, oh, good question. So this kind of was two and then we merged them together. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I probably should have put like where, which ones were mine and which ones were Narja. It's like the quarter sprint, that was mine. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I was like, look, I love having our lifestyle business, but I want to have that time every year that we like sprint towards something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was mine. Um, uh, yeah. That's so cool. That's a, a really sweet way to do it. Yeah. 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 So, so anyways, I think that's, that's kind of the main name of my slides uh, i know there's some other questions there too yeah um so you know i guess part of it is you know so you've been building this up for so 2016 it's been yeah, seven, seven years. years yeah so you're past that five-year mark it's yeah. so it is so true there is something about that five-year mark it is it's, it's so it's interesting so that, predictable it's yeah. incredible uh, do you feel that you're in cruise mode or do you feel, because again, it is about the lifestyle. I mean, do you have an idea, you know, there's data that proves, you know, anything you make above a hundred K a year, isn't going to add that much happiness to your life. Like right. do you subscribe to that. Is there, or is it, no, we have to keep ramping, ramping. There's no cruise mode. Like there, that's not. Yeah. It, it, it's a good question. How, um, like Philosophically. How do you think about that? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's it's a good question. Um, first of all, I think it's something that I uh, like. We kind of talk about as owners, like every six months, and and our opinions do change on, on this. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of view um, it's like income and time, and then there's like time wealth is like almost two metrics. It's like how much income are we make, and then how much like time wealth do you have? Um, and there is something that's interesting that. Um, I'm naturally oriented more towards coming from like the San Francisco startup culture, like just keep working and get yeah. as big as possible. But then my business partner's like, Hey, remember we, you wanted to build a lifestyle business. You love your lifestyle. And so she luckily keeps me in check and ensures that I'm getting and doing things that I, that I want. So, so to your point, um, it's something we think about often my current outlook on it, like heading into 2024 is we want to focus our time on like our core business and things that um, are producing good good returns yeah. um, financially. And we're trying to do a better job at editing away things that like have not worked out well. Mm. Um, so I think there's a diminishing return on time as an owner where an entrepreneurs have a tendency to like create work for themselves. So for instance, like Mexico, we has been, that was an interesting bold bet. Like we mm -hmm. launched in Mexico, but to be honest, we haven't seen the success we wanted to. And uh, so it, we, we've yeah. been in that market about a year yeah. and we haven't seen like the same amount of growth as we did early in the U S yeah. and we probably could make it work if we just dumped a ton more money and time into it. But we actually are deciding now just to close it. Wow, and, that's and a big decision. It, yeah. it is. Yeah. You know, we have probably 20, 25 customers down there now and, and um doing like a couple a couple hundred K a year of revenue. And, but um that is driven because it's taking up a ton of time mm. Narja and I. With the 80, 20 year old, right? Yeah, exactly. The yeah. Principle. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah like 80% of your yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's consuming a disproportionate amount of time. So we're actually shutting down Mexico. And the principle there is, look, we could actually take all those hours and either get them back in the form of like that time wealth, like yeah, just to do yeah. some more stuff with our family, uh, or just to be more available to like our core staff and, yeah. and what's needed. Yeah. So so I, I like to highlight that because I do feel like entrepreneurs are sometimes worried about shutting doors on stuff. You know, that's such a good point because I think uh, like a lot of decisions I make in our lives, period, but especially in business, is there's that loss aversion. Yeah. And okay, I put in so much effort, so much planning. We've invested, we've maybe hired 
it's you, you you just want to keep dumping more to get it is it well i've already put in this much i just put in a, a little, little bit, bit more, more yeah you know, yeah yeah it's 100 so percent true yeah. and something that we haven't been the best at with other bold bets we've taken on is you you start something and then it maybe doesn't hit your mm -hmm. your goals mm -hmm. but then you rationalize it and say okay well we're just going to put this on the back burner for now we'll come back to this but you don't you don't really like slam the door right, on it right. and and so what we've been better at like what we're doing with mexico is try something if it doesn't work just like fully shut it down yeah. so you're not getting you know like a weird like like tax change notice from the mexican government yeah. and then all of a sudden we have to like work with our lawyers to file yeah. this new tax yeah. thing and yeah. And, yeah. and um if you just book in stuff and that's my advice to young entrepreneurs is try yeah. stuff but if it doesn't work don't keep it as like an option. Just yeah, just cut it, out. cut it, and then move on to something else. If you want to reopen that Pandora's box down the road, maybe, maybe you can. Yeah. But um, editing away. So that's kind of going yeah. back to your point around where we're thinking about the future. It's like focusing on our core business, supporting our staff as much as possible, um, and then when we do take on bold bets, like our quarter sprint like giving like a year runway for those things. Mm -hmm. And then if they're not successful, like cutting, cutting them off mm -hmm. and then just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. start starting over with something yeah. else. Um, no, that's great. That's a good, good uh, parting words of wisdom, but uh, opening it up to questions. Uh, if anyone wants to jump in with a question, feel free. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ian. I, I come from mostly small businesses doing construction, design, build. Um, and what I've seen, when I was- Oh, you know what? Yeah, sorry, I'm going to throw this at you. So uh, design build uh, companies, and uh, mostly I, I was a project manager or designer. Um, and what I found with a lot of them is uh, that they ended up uh, as, as a growth proposition. They frequently topped out because their executive and sales end didn't grow. Uh, so I was wondering how you uh, intended to grow sort of your executive management level uh, as you grow, because that that seemed to be in most of the businesses that I was in the choke point, because they they would uh, as as the business, you know, as uh, more business came in, they would hire a bunch more people, but there are still only two owners. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, so thank you very to... much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's like that, that choking point. That's right. Like, when do you become? Um, uh... Yeah, and so I think the question that Ian brings up is like spot on. Yeah. And, and um, our staff have brought this to our attention. Um, yeah, as owners, when you look at hiring, like as I look at hiring sort of that mid-level management or more executive staff, it's tough because those people cost a lot of money. So as an owner, it, it when you start making investments, like if I were to hire, yeah, like a senior director of operations and, and you start hiring these roles, um, you're, it changes the economics of your business. Like, you know, and, and yeah, and it, and it starts in my mind to, um, yeah, sometimes be more, be more challenging to make like the, the unit economics work. So um, how we've addressed that from an employee standpoint is we've tried to focus on giving uh, employees more benefits that suit their their lifestyles, and instead of um, necessarily providing a company where um, there's like a ton of um, like upward like growth trajectory right. for that, yeah, or opportunity for them to make like like a, a ton of more money, um, we've focused on instead on um, like providing like added added benefits. So I talked about like that engineer that works for us that can like travel anywhere in the world. We have like a, like in down in El Salvador, we have like a four month maternity and paternity policy. Like that country doesn't even have, like their mat leave policies are like three weeks, like legally uh, down there. And so we've tried to provide more perks um, to kind of like make staff happy um, with, with, uh, with like the positions they're in. And then we do try to set realistic expectations that like, hey, like we're, we're probably not a company that's going to hire a larger like executive level staff that's going to allow us to become a much bigger business. Um, and that does mean that we do see some churn every once in a while. Like we have had a couple people leave us. Um, we've retained a lot more than we've lost, but we have had a couple people leave and say, hey, I just want to work at a company that's like growing more and investing more in growth. And 
I, I think as long as, um, in my opinion today, I might have a different opinion that's down the road, but as long as we're honest with like our staff and, um, you know, we, we do provide ways for them to like grow and make more money and get, pro get promoted. But as long as we're honest and say like, look, like we're not going to be the type of business that's going to like double by headcount. And we're probably not going to be like opening up director level mm -hmm. positions. Um, I think it attracts a certain type of certain type of person. Um, and like, for instance, we have like three moms that work for us down in El Salvador. And those women are just like very happy to sort of stay in, in that role. They're not as focused on like career mm -hmm. traje tra trajectory. Um, but yeah, there's actually been candidates where we've explained that to them in the interview process. And they were people that we kind of wanted but we decided, you know what, we need to like tell like this guy, Jose, he was a rock star. He would have been a great like account manager, but he had personal goals where he wanted to be like director of an, a large account management team within five years. He told me that was his goals. And realistically, like we're, we're probably not going to grow in that way. You, mm -hmm. you know, like we might hire additional account managers, but we're not going to have that hierarchy. So, so I don't know. It, it's a good question, Ian. I think it's something that a lot of small business owners struggle. We do become that choke point. Um, and I, I think as long as you embrace it and are honest with your staff, I think where it becomes a problem is where owners are like saying one thing, but then doing mm -hmm. another, you know, like I, th I think our staff all kind of knows what we're doing as a business. And I think they're happy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think when you start like pitching to the company and we, we have like our company all hands every month, and, you know, if we're talking about like massive growth and all these things and we're killing it and we're doing so well, and, and we want to like make investments and then we turn around and don't hire <laughs> that senior director of operations or we don't hire for these roles uh it yeah it's sort of like conflicts so uh, we, we try to be honest with our staff in that regard and, and attract people that are looking for that those lifestyle more, more driven that's, roles that's huge like just having that um well and that builds up that trust with your team it is what it is so either it's the fit for you or it's not it's like the it's the the basis of good sales, right? Yeah. Either we totally. meet your needs, uh, and if we don't, that's okay. There's another job somewhere else for you. Yeah, totally. Like another, another thing we give is we have an unlimited PTO policy. Mm. So our staff actually takes like a ton of time off. Like even down in El Salvador, they'll all take like four or five weeks a year, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we don't find that as owners. Uh, I think a lot of executives get stuck on this, but um, it's actually good to, to give your staff time. They mm -hmm. come back like super energized. They have trips they look forward to. Um, and it's actually like, I think like cheaper, more affordable just to give someone time off and, and like a paid vacation than trying to like hire more people mm -hmm. and then limiting time and then tracking it. And then, yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's kind of how we've approached that, but it's a good question in it. And it's not something that, um, isn't, there's an easy solution to it. Well, the, the, the solution is basically you've chosen your size and you're happy with it for now and if you want to grow, you know how to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of one. It's a thing. choice, right? It's it is a choice. Yeah. yeah. So, any, any other questions, Tony? Yeah. Jacqueline? Yeah. Um, with your partner, it's just you and the one partner, right? Yeah. Is there any, have you ever had any outside consultants kind of help you structure your business and help you kind of mediate the conflicts? You know, how do you kind of stay on the same track without there being, and, and have the same kind of vision throughout this whole process? Yeah. So I'm just going to repeat the question real quick. Yeah. So has it, has there ever been the need to hire someone to help mediate uh, the the the, biz, the business relationship between the two partners, basically? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question, um, Jacqueline. So there's a couple like trusted advisors. So the great thing about venture funded companies is you do have these investors and you, you do have like a board of directors that can kind of serve as an advisors and a CEO can go to them. We don't have that. So yeah, to your point, we realized very early on, if we make a, if we come up with an idea, we think it's like so brilliant and we just do it, we realize, oh, someone probably would have, like, for instance, opening up in Mexico, if we had a trusted board of advisors that was like really solid, that had expertise in that, they might've talked us out of doing that, you know? Um, but how, we, how we've tried to um, address this over time, because we are 50-50 partners. So there is like a deadlock potential mm -hmm. where we deadlock and then the business just can't move forward. So we basically have like three or four individuals, like a couple are like ex-consultants that worked for other Google partners. Um, we use our accountant as one trusted advisor. And then we have like this other like entrepreneur we really like. 
and, and we sort of have them as like our advisory council mm -hmm. that's but it's loose it's not mm -hmm. formal um some of them we pay like our accountant um and some of the consultants a couple of them do it like just for for free because they, they like yeah. us and and we try to talk to them every quarter and so we we do those like that's panel meetings I'm um, so glad you brought that up. So what, what, one of the things that we mandate from our startups in the incubator program is to set up an informal advisory board oh, so and important. to meet at least quarterly to help untangle and troubleshoot when, when necessary. So I'm glad yeah. you, you spoke to that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah and, and look, I think we need to even do a better job at it. Like I yeah. bring up Mexico, like we probably should have sought more, more counsel for that. Um, it was just hard. We couldn't find someone that had enough background with our type of industry in Mexico. Um, so we just went for it. Um, but to your point, that's important. Legally, um, we have like a pretty solid operating agreement um, that um, actually it, it, it doesn't have like much of an arbitration like clause in there, um, kind of by design. Um, uh, but there is like a potential with deadlocking. So kind of our matters are if we get to a point where we really want to like have different opinions on something. So I'll use an example. Like um, a couple of years ago, Narjit brought up the idea of like, hey, what if her husband leaves his job and joins in the business? And I, I didn't actually want that because it then all of a sudden become like two mm. versus one. It's just a different dynamic. And that was something we were at odds on because she really wanted it. I really didn't want it. And the process we sought is we kind of went through that advisory council and, you know, gave our pitch to each one of them on like a video call. They kind of gave us their feedback and then wrote up like their recommendation. And then we kind of looked at that overall. And then we ultimately decided incorporating their ad advice to, to not go down that path. Mm -hmm. um, we've done that a few different times with, with different things. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned my drive to like want to work more hours. There was a point where I like went to Narjit and was like, Hey, I want to work more hours. I, I think I should maybe get paid, you know, more, more money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she's like, no, actually hours don't equal value. And so we kind of were at odds there and we were able to like go to that same council and then realize, you know what, like, I started a lifestyle business. I need to do a better job at probably embracing those principles. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some anecdotal examples and some structures we put in place. But it is super important to have like a clear operating agreement. Uh, we actually have those advisors and, and that process outlined on how we go about that. Um, I think a lot of businesses die because their partners get like stuck at a deadlock, mm -hmm. um, which is um, which is sad. Yeah, so, it doesn't. Yeah, 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 it is. I mean, it is a business. Totally, totally. No. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Great, yeah. Thank you so much, Ronald. Thanks, guys. It's so great to have you. Yeah, uh, thank thanks you. Thanks for making the time. It's, it's great to learn um, so much about the business and how, how you manage it. It's, it's very a very unique and different approach. So Great, thank, thank you, Judy. Yeah, and yeah, and, uh, yeah we, I'm always um, in awe of all the stuff you guys are doing here at thank the you. Cal Poly CIE. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. I'll be around here, guys. So happy to yeah. talk with anyone one-on-one, -on -one, so. And just to wrap, a couple of things coming up. Uh, we have a workshop. It's uh, how to sell online uh, from Etsy to Amazon, September 21st. Uh, it's virtual. There is a, a small fee attached to that, but it's a, it's a really, really great workshop. So if anyone has uh, online, you know, doing e-commerce, uh, sign up. And then we are launching our seventh year of AngelCon 2024. So we have an investor session this Friday. Uh, 8 30 to 11. If anyone's interested in um, putting in $6,000 into the fund to participate in this process, it's an insane group of investors. There's lots of new people every year. We meet once a month. We train our investors to learn how to invest in startups. Um, lots of great content. We bring speakers from literally all over the US to, to talk about uh, deal terms, how to select the right startup, et cetera. And then the investors get together and pick their top six startups uh, and then choose the one to invest in. So we pool all the money together. We raise anywhere between hundred to $200,000. Uh, and that money, the investors will invest the entirety into one startup. So we run that every year. If you are interested or I know anyone who is interested, please join. Uh, and I think that's it for upcoming events.
Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Great. Thanks, yeah, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah.